the Numinous Podcast with Carmen Spaniola. Hi there, and welcome to the Numinous Podcast, where we have interesting conversations with everyday folks about the mystery of life. This podcast is a compliment to the Numinous School, my online intuition development program for people who want their self awareness to serve a greater good. And hey, Did you know that the Numinous School only opens for registration once a year? Yeah, and this year, 2018, it's June 1st. So if you like this conversation in this episode today, you will love the Numinous School. So if you're interested in the Numinous School, you should probably get on the wait list because I only open it to a certain number of people. The reason why is because I only print so many textbooks. This year, it'll be about two dozen. So if you'd like to get on the wait list, you need to go to my website and uh, click on courses, click on the Numinous School, you'll see waitlist registration there. Anyway, back to the show. Today on the show, I am welcoming Sarah Kerr. Sarah is a death doula and a ritual healing practitioner. And I've done some work with Sarah in the past. I've been to her workshop, I've been to her talk, and I was very keen to follow up with her about a lecture she gave on the shamanic archetype. I connected with Sarah online. She was at home in Calgary, Alberta. Sarah, what identities do you lead with? Hmm, You know, there are lots of ways to answer that question. One way is kind of the business card identity, uh, which is that I am a death doula and a ritual healing practitioner. And I could go down a long rabbit hole about those titles um i was a death midwife now i'm a death doula there's a story behind that and what is a death doula i think it's lots of things to lots of people and i i add ritual healing practitioner onto that because that's the particular kind of death doula i am and i'm interested really in in the spiritual and emotional and relational transformation that happens at death and Ritual healing practitioner is the best name I've come up with for that. Another way I describe myself is clergy for the unchurched. So (laughs) it's a a ritual, spiritual guidance perspective on death and dying. So that's that's one way to answer the question. Uh, I'm a white woman. I'm a descendant of early Canadian settlers. I live in Western Canada. I feel very connected to this land. And... And I feel like I I walk an identity boundary between one who, when people talk about the indigenous soul or indigenous perspectives that way, I feel like I have that kind of internal relationship with the land and with the spirits and with the ancestors and with the living universe. And yet I'm really clear that there's a, a kind of sociological indigenous perspective i guess and then there's a political one and that's a very different story so i walk that balance very carefully because i really recognize and respect the political situation around what it means to be indigenous in canada so again lots of rabbit holes to go in around that but that that sort of feels like a good starting place thank you yes that's an excellent starting place uh just for the listeners benefit i i would like them to know that we're able to have this conversation we're about to have because Uh, I've followed your work, I've been to some of your talks, I've been to your workshop, we've had a meal, we've broken bread. So we've done some kind of risky work together in that way. And so I'm very excited (laughs) to share with the listeners uh, that we're going to be able to get to some interesting places. Also because you have a tremendous amount of uh, research and academic experience uh, behind you. And so I would like to ask a follow-up question to a video I saw (laughs) of you giving a speech. Mm -hmm. Could you please describe the difference between the priest-priestess archetype, the psychopomp, and the shaman? If you could define and, and describe the difference to them, because my sense and what I observe is that people use these terms almost interchangeably and lead with those identities and i don't think there's a shared collective sense of what they actually mean so i'd love to hear you describe the difference between those three archetypes 
Ooh, this is conversation I love. This is fun <laughs> to dig into this. So the video you're talking about is called The Shamanic Archetype, a contemporary exploration. And it's available for free on my website if people want to watch it. And in the lead up to it, I say that I rarely use the word shaman because I, I don't want to use it unless I have an hour to describe what I mean. And so this video is that hour. So mm -hmm. all to say, we could spend the whole hour repeating what's in the video, but that's not necessary. It's, there's a lot behind that. And in the video, uh, I talk about this, the archetype of the shaman as a natural expression of human identity that emerges in every group of humans of every time and every place and is met in different ways by their cultures and in land-based tribal traditional indigenous cultures from whom we all descend. There was in general, and nothing can be universalized about any groups like that, but in general, a respect for that and an understanding of what to do when someone expressed this innate capacity to be able to be in touch between the worlds. And that that is, that is a universal human phenomena, and how it's met in each culture varies. And so when someone says, I'm a shaman, all my spidey senses go off, because I, I want an hour to unpack that. Yes, there are people in our culture, in modern Western European descendant society, who do have that capacity to be in touch with and to be a, a mediator between this world and the other on behalf of healing in both worlds. And whether we need to call ourselves shamans or not, I don't know. I don't, I don't use that word because it's so loaded, but I recognize that there is an archetype. We don't have another word for what that archetype is. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a bit in, in defining the shaman. And for me, we can't really talk about shamans and shamanism without talking about animism. And uh, again, this traditional uh, ancient approach that all of us are descended from, where we see the world as alive and participatory and engaged. And the, what we do and what the trees are doing is in relationship with each other. And there's a, a reciprocity and a relationship happening. And in an animistic perspective, everybody is in touch with the non-human world, the other than human world. And some people are particularly gifted at it and particularly wired for it and, and can do it on behalf of healing and they become the shamans. I think what happens in Western culture is that we mix up the fact that it's a normal and natural human birthright to be able to talk to the trees and to receive teachings in our dreams and to know how to make offerings and to transport our consciousness with drum beats. It's a different thing to be the person who is in the community, the specialist at keeping those balances between the worlds. Mm -hmm. And I Can think we slow down and repeat that. It is a different thing to be in community. So there's two parts. There's something, you know, to be the specialist. So your community has to meet you and say, you are a shaman. There's something special about you. You are a specialist. And we trust you to be our uh, conduit or our envoy or messenger. Have I got you there? Yes, although it's there's a twist in there too but the but yes there's a specialist and not everybody's a specialist but you don't need to be that in order to be in conversation that there's a big opening for other people and yes in traditional communities the someone would perform these services and be recognized for but in our culture we don't have a structure to support people going through that process because it requires an initiation to develop that specialty. Mm -hmm. And so we often don't meet them. Mm -hmm. So making the being met by your community a requirement for it, yes, it probably is, but we don't always get it. So mm -hmm. there's a, there are some complications in there. But mostly I think it's that living in relationship with a, a, a living world is normal. And to say, people talk about shamanic cultures which is kind of like saying, well, we live in a doctorish culture. Mm -hmm. it's, that's, those are the healers. They're a per, per, certain part of it, but really animism is a better way to describe it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. And so then how is that different from the psychopomp archetype and the priest-priestess archetype? 
So psychopomp, psyche is soul, pomp is guide. Psychopomps are the guides of souls. Although my spell check always wants to change it to cycle pump. <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft Word hasn't really means, gotten on board with this yet. Greater spiritual literacy in yes. their dictionaries, yeah. Yes. So, uh, psychopomp, people use it as a noun, as a verb. It's, um, and how to describe, so psychopomp, the psychopomp function essentially gets people from this side to the other. Well, there's some expansion. Okay. Guide of soul. Some people use it to say a guide of soul through any transition. I think that complicates it a little bit. Uh, you know, psychotherapists, the, the healing souls, it's on the same track. So some people are using psychopomp to describe any aspect of soul transition through life. For me, it's more useful to keep it just around death, around physical bodily death. And so uh, there are psychopomp beings there are spirit beings whose job it is to support us as we leave this side and cross to the other. In different cultures, they appear in different presentations. The Egyptian god Anubis, you know, the, the ferryman on the river Styx. Uh, I work a lot with a, a Celtic goddess named Arianad, who's a spiral goddess of the moon who returns the dead. So there are different... Um, living spiritual entities who serve that purpose. People experience sometimes ancestors coming as psychopomp guides, sometimes animals, often dogs, birds. So there are the psychopomp beings who we can engage with and work collaboratively with, essentially to help our dead get where they need to go. And then there are also human beings who can cross the veil who through various altered states of consciousness, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not, that can be confusing, <laughs> are, are able to, to cross that veil and support people across that. And people do it in different ways. Sometimes they're called death walkers, people who have that um, capacity to, to visit the village of the ancestors. And, uh, you know, shamans have been known as the doctors of the living and the dead, and their job in keeping balance in the whole community, human and otherwise, means keeping balance with the ancestors. And uh, an affliction on this side of the river may be a reflection of something out of balance in the ancestral realm. So shamans are psychopomps, among other things. Mm -hmm. And from, in my work, I mean, I've studied the kind of classic Western, quote-unquote, shamanic practices of psychopomp, which are, again, sort of techniques of consciousness for helping people who are stuck, who've died but haven't for some reason crossed over, helping them get where they need to go. And it's very powerful, very, very powerful work. What I do as a ritualist is, you know, my approach to this idea of the shamanic archetype is is much more collective. I think in Western culture, we've individualized what was traditionally a community process. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you can go see a psychopomp practitioner and they can be in their room and work and do the work for you. My work with dying people and their families is really about how the community facilitates the psychopomp function happening, or maybe how I, as a ritual facilitator, choreograph the community to make that energetic transition happen mm -hmm. so that's where psychopomp is a function rather than a person mm -hmm. perfect that, that that's fantastic i think that's very clarifying because it is tricky when something is used as both a noun and a verb <laughs> right. and when it can be human and other than human yes yes exactly and and so then the priest priestess so for me, the, the, the shamanic archetype is really about the, um, the crossing of the veil. And sometimes that's a, that's a role that requires a little bit of separation. You know, the witches in the European communities lived on the edges, halfway between the forest and the people, and they're a little separate. And, and that's, a, that's a certain kind of role. And, and to really be able to to be open and in connection with both sides of the veil like that, sometimes you can't be too deeply in the human community. You need to be a little bit of a, a, an edge walker. 
And for me, the priest or priestess, and it's just, you know, gender, you can pick whichever you want, doesn't really matter how that falls out, or a new word that reflects that, is less about being the intermediary and more about being the officiant. And this, how do we choreograph this community to find the healing that's needed? And that it's more of a space holder, more of a leader role. And I don't, you know, with the shamanic archetype, there's lots of resources and lots of literature to speak to that. And I, I either I don't know it or it's not there. I'm not as familiar with it in terms of where the priest priestess fits in. This is more just an intuitive perspective that it's, there's a leadership community building aspect of the priest and priestess, which is not necessarily built into the shamanic perspective. And so people can be one or the other or all three or some combination of that. Mm -hmm. I took a really interesting uh, course once on um, sort of the burning times, basically, you know, the history um, of spirituality sort of around 1000 kind of thing and beyond. And uh, one point that the professor made was the difference between sort of a, a witch and a mystic was literacy. And so I sometimes think of the priest priestess archetype as not necessarily being literate in in sort of the academic sense, but having a sense of the, the cipher or the skeleton key. They're, they're, they're sort of the pattern makers that are able to interpret for the community. And so it, it almost implies that it's not always one-on-one -on -one work, right? Whereas the, the, the sh relationship with the shaman um, can be communal, but very often we think of it as being kind of interpersonal and, and you know, two people in a dimly lit room, that kind of thing, um, or the shaman sort of doing his own thing. Whereas I often think of the priest priestess archetype as, as you say, having community, and it's not necessarily about um, hierarchy, but that they have this body of knowledge and that they are sort of holding something that is collective knowledge and stewarding it and dispersing it and, and that sort of thing. Do you think that's relevant or related? Oh, so much in there. Um, so the mystic, I would say, in the shaman, priest, priestess, psychopomp, I would say mystic is another category in there. Mm -hmm. And when I think of the mystic, I think of the hermit mm -hmm. or the deep meditator or in traditional European conditions where a, where a monk was actually... The, the walled room was built in the cathedral and the monk was bricked into the room and their job was to meditate. Mm -hmm. Or I spent a lot of time in Nelson. There's a, a convent that is now becoming a hospice, but it was a cloistered convent. Mm -hmm. And the nuns there prayed on behalf of that community and people supported them to do it. Mm -hmm. For me, that's more where mystic fits in, that it is it is even more isolated mm -hmm. and, um, and more, even more internal in a way than shaman and not necessarily the healer. The shaman is more the healer. The mystic is like the ballast that holds mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I would say mystic fits in there too, but it's, it's a little bit more on the cushion perhaps mm -hmm. and internal rather than participatory or, or, externally participating. Right. And I think, I think, you know, the shaman in the dimly lit room, one-on-one, -on -one, that's a very Western vision. Mm. In traditional communities, those rituals were not happening in dimly lit. Everybody was there. Mm. The whole community came and was fed and was part of it. And that's where I think we have, you know, in any, in any evolution, we only evolve as far as we can. And we certainly, we sometimes have a kind of mortgage to what came before. Mm -hmm. so I feel like the first wave of, again, in quotes, shamanism in Western culture came with a mortgaged individualism. Mm -hmm. And so we developed this model that is quite dual, linear, and individualist. One person works on another and it flows in a straight line. Mm -hmm. And then our next step in evolving that is to be more connected, community-based, collective in how the healing works. 
So since we're in this kind of liminal space in uh, our cultural and political atmosphere, I'm, and we're trying to evolve, m many are trying to evolve into uh, more collectivist approaches. What do you think as, you know, okay, as two white women of Western European ancestry living in Canada, trying to approach uh, our work through a lens of reconciliation or at least deep acknowledgement, what are some of the considerations <laughs> for those of us who are doing this kind of, you know, journey work, working between the realms, one foot here, one foot there? Uh, and what do we need to acknowledge? What do you think are some of the considerations about using the word shamanism and uh, how we share what we do? I think there are many considerations and they're important that we, as I talked about earlier, we need to recognize that that much of what we, and I speak for myself, much of what I know and who I've studied with and what I've learned, I've been able to do that because these traditions have been kept alive by indigenous people here and in other places where I've studied in South America and others, kept alive by people in the face of incredible oppression. and so that we can't come to those traditions now and forget that that's why they're here. So we need to keep in mind the, the past and present impacts of colonialism and what's happening. And, and I think be involved at a political level in supporting those causes, not only because it's in a way in, in honoring the lineage that we're in, in some ways, I guess we're in that lineage in some ways, not honoring in some ways, but also because it's the right thing to do and it's about balance and health and, and justice. And to, to recognize that we can feel the shamanic archetype arising within us and we can approach the world through an animus lens without the blessing, without needing the blessing of an indigenous culture. To register that we will probably never approach the depth of what someone who grew up in indigenous culture can touch because of the lineage, because of the field they live in, but that we're allowed to do that, that that's a human birthright to live in dynamic reciprocal relationship with the world. And, and part of that is registering the, the current cultural and political implications. And in, in my work, my really, my really deep hope is that, if we can change our minds, literally, from that Western programming to a more animist, some people would say indigenous, I think animist is a better descriptor of that, to a more animist perspective, it's, it's in a way doing anti-racist decolonializing work in ourselves. Because we can't see in the other what we just can't see. And they become the other. If we can in ourselves refine that way of being in relationship with the world, we can meet Indigenous people on their terms instead of asking them to meet us on Western terms. I, uh, I have a friend who's done a lot of work around graphic novels, and I remember he told me a story about a, an Indigenous, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but it was a, a Canadian Indigenous man who was a, a graphic novelist, comic book drawer, and he instead of there being square boxes with white lines between, his were more, um, almost looked Pacific Northwest with ovoids and different angles. And, and the, the spaces between were black. And every once in a while, he'd reach up into that space. The character would reach into that space and pull some of the space in and make a spear out of it mm. or do something. And, and I remember my friend talking about that that was such a different perspective that instead of, a bunch of things existing in a nothingness. Mm. This was the perspective that everything exists within a something and that something is mm. what, we're, what we're engaged with. And if, if the settlers who came to North America had seen that something, mm -hmm. maybe things would have been different, but instead they saw nothing. Mm. So I feel like it's us needing to wake up our ability to see that it's not nothing, it is something. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing you say in, a, in overtly and sort of between the lines is that the shaman has an intimate relationship with justice 
and I'm and I'm hearing you say that it extends to the human realm and the more than human realm. And so what would you say to somebody who's built a business, let's say, or a brand or, you know, a world and a self identity that, that is public around that, let's say first wave Western uh, sh quote unquote shamanic identity. And if, and if they were exploring this relationship with justice, how, how would you <laughs> advise that person? <laughs> You know, I don't have any perspectives on what's right or wrong for anybody else. For me, it hasn't been a word that I've felt that I've needed to identify with. But it it has become a word, and, and words change. I mean, that word's been in the English language since the 1600s. So it means something, and it's complex. So for someone who has a, a business or an identity built up around that, I think for me, a huge part is, is around what's the intention underneath that and what's the awareness and the, both the self-awareness and the cultural awareness around the implications of that word and who are we claiming to be and in whose name. So I think there are, there are ways of doing, there's ways of doing the same thing with integrity and grace and right relationship or not. And so what the name on your business card is, to me, is of less interest to the heart perspective you bring underneath it and to the self-exploration you're doing and to the, the way in which you're holding the work relative to all these other issues we've been talking about. So, you're, so I hear you saying that. I'm going to push back a bit because you've chosen really to not use the word and in fact dedicate an hour and now even more <laughs> to unpacking it before using it. And so I, I feel like you're at least not saying, but you're pointing to something <laughs> because I'm sure that you're, you know, I guess what I'm saying is it that sounds like it's coming back to the, well, as long as your intention is good argument, but I think there's the impact versus intent and there is an impact in terms of the social proof of what is acceptable of, of, of declaring oneself a shaman. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. Well, and it's interesting, I don't use the word, but I wrote a dissertation, <laughs> the subtitle of which, telling my own story, was a contemporary Western shamanic initiation. And so for me, claiming was a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And and in a way, once I'd claimed it so deeply and in such complexity in the writing of that, I didn't need it anymore mm -hmm. or something. There was something about being able to, to say, yes, these experiences I'm having and this pattern that's unfolding in my life, this is what it is. It is the archetype of the shaman. And all these reasons why it was hard for me to claim that, including these... The, the whole mores of, yeah, white people can't be shamans. So I was struggling with that too. So I, in a way I have claimed it and, but now don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one perspective on that. And, you know, good intentions are good enough. Yes, that argument has holes in it, but at the same time it does, it does hold in a way, you know, how we, how we approach it and how we behave beyond just the title. Like, mm -hmm. What are we doing with that? Mm -hmm. What are we doing in relationship to Indigenous people and Indigenous causes? Mm -hmm. How are we promoting it? What's our relationship with, I think what it really comes down to is what's our relationship with the spirits who are guiding us? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, for me, so much of my learning, I lived in the Bay Area, I studied with lots of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, but a huge part of my learning and teaching came through dreams and through opening up in a way kind of a direct channel back to that knowing. And so if, if your direct channel back to the sources who are, who are sustaining your practice authorizes you to do that, then that's, to me, and you're in right relationship with those and reading those messages clearly, then that's your path. And walk it as well as you can. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm going to give listeners the benefit of the doubt and say if they've gotten this far and they understand some of the terms around privilege and colonialism, that sort of thing, then they probably are in a position to be able to, to trust that. Mm -hmm. My experience in a lot of kind of, um, you know, what's popularly called the white woman sisterhood is that there isn't a lot of cultural literacy around the settler colonialism inherent within us if we come from European American ancestry. And there's, an, there's a lot of, let's say, spiritual bypassing that says that, well, my intentions are good enough. And they kind of come in that category of I don't see color and that sort of thing, which I know is not your... Um, I've heard you speak so many times, uh, so I know that you locate your work very uh, intentionally and thoughtfully and uh, critically in the context that we find ourselves in. I want to circle back to your dissertation, which was called Dreams, Ritual, and the Creation of Sacred Objects. And uh, I'm going to just kind of give you a little synopsis of a highlight reel for me. Uh, people can find your dissertation online. It's actually right in your about page. Uh, now, you talk about the scapegoating of the, the archetype of the shaman and how this is showing up in Western culture. And the scapegoat itself is an archetype that has four parts, you say. There's the accuser, the victim, the priest, and the exile. This is how the scapegoat comes into being, is actually these four parts. And in order to heal the scapegoat, we need to uh, address these and integrate these four parts within ourselves, the accuser, the victim, the priest, priestess, and the exiled one. And you say that one of the ways to heal this uh, scapegoating is the journey of the walk away. I want to just pause for a sec as a little citation. Those four models are not my model. That I think that's Karen Jenicky. So I, yes. I cite them, but those, that's not my model, just for academic integrity. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a heavily cited. cited <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So the journey of the walk away, there's sort of four options for the, the, the person who is the exiled one, not being well met by culture, when they do this walking away and turning away from uh, the culture in their exile. So option A, they can stay exiled and individuate there, come into themselves. B, they can stay exiled and ego identify with the marginalized role. I'm, I'm a marginalized person. C, they can stay in exile and be crushed by the experience. Or D, they can individuate in exile and then return to teach or interpret. And that really jumped out at me, that, that part, because it speaks so strongly, I think, to that feeling of being an uninitiated, now adept, you know, a person who has these skills of being able to walk between the worlds. Uh, in, in, in not just the, the shamanic archetype, but I think sometimes the other ones as well, they're just so unrecognized in a European and American context. And so here you are in some kind of exile, and what the hell do you do? And so this fourth option of individuating in exile and then coming back as te teacher interpreter I think I, for myself, and it seems for you, becomes particularly tricky, risky, you know, can be particularly vulnerable when you are a public figure. You know, you're, you're earning your income doing this kind of work. You're, you, you, know, you have a podcast, you're on interviews, you're, you know, and so I would love to know how that, uh, parallels or, you know, what, when you wrote this in 2012, what message were you sending to your future self who would become a death doula in the world? I'd forgotten how, uh, how juicy those four parts were. Um, and this idea of exile, individuation, and then return. For me, the the magic link in there is initiation. That 
the initiatory archetype says you leave you leave the world you knew and whether that's a journey inwardly or, or outwardly you leave the world you, you knew you go through these trials and tribulations you learn and then you return and key you are received there's mm -hmm. lots of incomplete initiation in fact um, psychologist ed tick talks about veterans trauma as an incomplete initiation they mm -hmm. leave they enter a different world they go through the trials and tribulation they return but they are not received so it's the leave transform return receive cycle that is what allows i think the exile to come back and occupy a place and i wrote those while i was deep in the exile feels like a strong word when i talk about my own experience but i was i was not living in the world i was both in an academic program which is its own kind of otherworldly experience and i was trying to navigate these experiences i was having where the other world the real other world was was opening up to me and trying to find my feet and trying to do the healing in my own system and and find how to claim who i was and i think now as i look back on it that one of the reasons i began that doctoral program is because that's one of the few models in western culture where the initiatory archetype is alive and well mm. that we we leave we go into this intense experience we have this really um, focused hard task to achieve um, we are mentored by elders who were mentored by elders who were mentored by elders everyone has a phd was granted it by someone who got a phd who was granted it goes back a thousand years hmm. it's one of the only lineages that we have access to that really is intact you have a ceremony where you wear a, a, a costume <laughs> and walk across the stage and when you finish you are a new person you have a new name hmm. so that the archetypal components of that initiation were part of what gave me the capacity to do this and and i wrote my dissertation on the archetype of initiation i lived it i talked i i really did the initiatory thing and so i wrote that while i was in exile and in a kind of circular way the writing of it and my own coming to terms it, even the challenge of, of choosing to write about this and that took me a long time to even be able to do that and then to write my own story as my own initiatory journey is part of what allowed me to come back and i was received so on one hand at, a, at, a, at an external level i have a phd there is there is i walk through the world with a, a certain level of legitimacy that has been bestowed on me hmm. that helps a lot mm -hmm. you know that that being met by my community and being recognized mm -hmm. that gives me an internal validation it, it doesn't work if you don't also have the internal part but it, it helps mm -hmm. and i at graduation there was the formal across the stage with the hat and cap and gown graduation but that to the ritual me just did not feel like enough so i had another ritual which was the night before and i rented a community hall and i was in oakland i don't know 30 or 40 people flew down from canada we had and i asked four friends of mine to design and carry out the ritual and they i just showed up and followed their instructions and part of it was telling my story and being received and then there were very very strong ritual components that that walked me from that place of exile exile both because i'd chosen to be a student and because i was having these otherworldly experiences back into my community can you like give us a little this is like eating one chip can you give us <laughs> one example of a powerful ritual component in that night you know there's a saying that the ritual is the period at the end of the sentence so a huge part of it was the lead up to it inviting people knowing people were coming getting ready for it this is this is the moment you know it's a it's a kind of coming out it's a mm -hmm. stepping forward so that was even just that structure 
that I knew at this night, between that evening and then the formal graduate, I was going to be someone new. So the mm-hmm. whole, your soul just gets all ready for that and, and, and everything pops out and I had all the fears and everything. So it was, you know, all the things that we have before these big transitions. Mm-hmm. So that was a big part of it. Um, people gathering, people coming, people decorating the place, people doing this on my behalf. Mm-hmm. That was a hard thing for me. Mm-hmm. I, I, am, I am actually, this is, this is, this felt all about me. And in a way it, it, it was kind of right that it was, and it wasn't all about me. Lots of people had their own experiences in it. And um, so there was a gather. I can't remember the beginning. It was gathering and people kind of context setting and everybody introducing themselves. Oh, everybody brought a stone. Everybody was asked mm-hmm. to bring a stone with something written on it about uh, a strength they saw in me. Mm-hmm. And those stones are still in a circle around my altar. They mean a lot to me. And... Um, um uh, part of it, uh, part of my work had been so dreams rituals and the creation of sacred objects i'd been receiving these dream teachings about ritual objects to make and so i'd been squirreled away in my studio in oakland making these ritual objects many of which no one has seen except that night mm. and so they were all laid out on an altar in the middle of the room mm. and i went through each one and i explained the dreams i explained the teachings i explained what they were and I, I really, that felt like even more than the defense of my dissertation. That was my, here, here's what I've been doing. Because for wow. many of my friends and family, they didn't really know what I was doing down here. <laughs> it sounded a bit weird. And they were supporting me, but they didn't really get it. Uh-huh. And this was about bringing them in and saying I couldn't talk about it while it was happening. Mm-hmm. But this is, I want you to be part of this because you were part of it. And you deserve to know. Mm-hmm. So, uh that that telling my story and i remember so strongly in the the weeks leading up to that ceremony having this just incredible urge to have two rings tattooed one on the fourth finger of either hand and that one that what i felt like that ceremony was was a a marriage to spirit and community the stepping Mm -hmm. forward and saying i have been studying and and learning and developing these capacities and now i want to step out and be in service and i want to be in service to both sides of the veil Mm. the human the visible the tangible and the invisible and the unseen i i I had a tattoo artist convince me not to because he said tattoos on hands don't work so well but oh it was such a strong urge so that was really the guiding force that this was this is what the ceremony would do Mm-hmm. So there were other aspects of the ceremony. The final part was that um, they had told me to make a cape. I just couldn't get it all organized. So the night before, my mom was in town. And I asked my mom to make the cape. So my mom <laughs> made me a cape, nice. which was sweet. And then uh, there were all these squares of fabric. And each person got a square of fabric and there were pens. And they traced their hand and drew something. And then one by one, they came up and they pinned their hands on this cape. Mm. So here I was feeling all the hands of this community supporting me. Mm. and then a really big didgeridoo just <laughs> blow the youngest little eight-year-old girl holding up the end of it because it was 12 feet long and 14 inches wide at the end her holding it up just with her hands above her head so it was right at my heart oh. this whole community holding this intention that it was like setting the die mm. that this is what this sound did mm. and that ritual changed me as rituals do it is a it changes you at the energetic level Mm. Mm. powerful i would like to ask you if you have any rituals or particular approaches when it comes to working with emotions like grief and rage because that was a beautiful affirmation in a moment of joy and like a happy initiation (laughs) but what about when your initiation is super messy (laughs) <laughs> or when it's just messy initiation yeah. or not <laughs> right. um, for me those are are palpable energies that need to be moved so uh, I know not long ago someone cut me off in traffic I was driving and it was they pulled out and it was just about a really messy accident and I was every molecule in my body was electrified for that 
and I pulled over and I just shrieked and just let the just explosive how angry I was that they had done that. And just, I mean, I screamed my head off for three or four minutes. Mm. And I stopped and I was like, okay, it's true. Mm. And so I didn't spend the rest of the day driving around thinking, oh, the perm. <laughs> so it's a movement. And that was fast and the response was fast. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the buildup is slower and the response has to be a little different. But for grief and rage, it's, you know, grieving as an idea that I'm moving this energy out. And I'm moving it out and I'm moving it out as an offering to the earth that, that she needs that the way I need clean air, oxygen to breathe. It's, it's my offering. So it's moving it somehow, moving it through physical activity, moving it through emotional expression, moving it through making art, moving it through writing, moving it. Why do you think the earth needs our grief? It, let's say your grief was very personal, like somebody you love died. That's a teaching that I learned from Maladoma Somme. That, and the way he explained it is that the, the earth slash the spirits, for him, those really aren't differentiated. <laughs> that the relationship between humans and the spirit world is similar to the relationship between, say, plants and animals. Where we breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2, they breathe in CO2 and breathe out oxygen. We need what they produce, they need what we produce. But what we produce is a byproduct and toxic to ourselves. Mm. And that the spirits are fed by our grief and by our, the purity of our truly expressed emotions. And they, they're nourished by that they then transform that into clean, clear potential energy that we then use for creativity. And that the buildup of grief and, and in Peru, they call it hucha, this is sticky, tarry energy, which is grief and anger and resentment and rage and jealousy, all that like life stuff we get. It's just a natural byproduct of being alive. And like brushing your teeth, you just have to let it move. Mm. And that it, we return it, it's not bad, it's just in the wrong place when it's in us. So for me, that's where that image comes from. It's been really helpful for me. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure this conversation has been extremely helpful for a lot of people who love this kind of um, topic, but maybe are challenged to find the kind of um, the, the depth, the critical approach. And just like, you know, there's a self-awareness about how you are moving between the worlds that is so refreshing. And uh, I find it very um Uh, nutrient rich for my soul. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience, Sarah. Thank you for doing your work to bring uh, the work of uh, uh, the the psychopomp, the shamanic archetype, you know, all of this into a, a, a forum for the collective to consider. I just, I'm invigorated by your work. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, you're very welcome, Carmen. And thank you so much for holding this space for conversation. I mean, the topics you cover here are so important. It's, it's really important to make these spaces. So I appreciate that. And, and it's just been a delight deepening our connection over the years. I'm glad. Thanks. Wow, we really covered a lot of territory there. But I want to go back and lift up something Sarah said there. That the work we're referring to when we use the word shaman has been stewarded for generations against all odds by those people who even today have to fight to reclaim or even have some space in the public realm to grieve the theft of that work and that ancestry and those traditions and that lineage. So we need to be very respectful. I also want to say that the journey of the walk away is, I mean, it's so captivating that, that phrase to me. Um, and I think it will speak to many people who kind of walk between the worlds and, uh, whether it's because they've done it for so long, they've been able to kind of, uh, see past the veil or can, or connect across dimensions with other beings, maybe since they were young, or maybe they've had a, a spontaneous initiation experience that the culture has, has described as 
a psychological break, you know, or maybe at the most gentle might have called a spiritual emergency. But when we are not well met by our community or our culture, there are times when it's appropriate to take distance. But exile isn't healing in itself. There is work to do there. I, I really do highly recommend uh, Dreams, Ritual, and Creation of Sacred Objects just to read about Sarah's personal experience with uh, initiation. And you can find that in the show notes on my website. You can also find it on Sarah's website, which is soulpassages.ca. And if you are around Calgary, uh, Alberta, you might want to check out her offering, which is the Calgary Community Healers Council. And I'd, I'd, while we're at it, I'd like to thank all of my listeners in Alberta. That is actually where my family immigrated from Scotland to Canada five generations ago. All of my family is buried around Stettler, Alberta. So uh, I feel quite a lot of kinship to that area, especially to the ranching community. I don't know anybody really in that community, but I feel in my bones a lot of admiration and appreciation and um, feel like I can relate to loving that kind of landscape. Thank you very much for spending time with me today. You know, quest is a rite of passage that can facilitate the walk away, the taking distance from a community or culture that isn't meeting you. It can also help you do the work of exile and it can help with return, returning in a good way. So if you'd like to learn more information about coming on quest with me this June, you can go to my website, carmenspaniola.com, C-A-R-M-E-N-S-B-A-G-N-O-L-A. Just click on retreat so you can even put your deposit down right now. I'd love to have you join us. Until next time, take care. <laughs>